Good morning and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Nikki Stewart and I'll be joining you and hosting a webinar talking about well-being during uh, our coronavirus lockdown period. So first of all, let's go to our first slide. So I am a BACP accredited counsellor. I use an integrative approach with my clients. Um, I also provide in, uh, inset training sessions to schools. Uh, I run the wellbeing program at Homewood House School, as you know. Um, I am also a mental health first aid England adult and youth instructor. So, and I also offer clinical supervision to trainee supervisors as well as uh, qualified um, counsellors. Now, I've worked in the field of mental health services for the last 13 years. Um, I've had placements with uh, Phoenix Futures, Place to Be, Family Matters, and also the London Borough of Bexley. So I bring a wealth of mental health experience with me into this facilitation. So today we're going to be talking about what community trauma is, how it's impacted us during this time. I'm going to be looking at how we can help ourselves and look at our resilience during this pandemic. And really this is to help you help your children to emotionally regulate. So we'll be looking at how emotional regulation um, can be useful during this time. And also self-care for yourselves as adults looking after your young people. Uh, we'll be looking at boundaries, healthy boundaries, as well as sleep. And then at the end, we can have some question and answers. So as with any Zoom meeting, I'm sure you've all been on screen recently. Uh, we just need to make an agreement. Um, this is a space for you all to share. So there will be opportunities for questions and answers. Um, if anybody would like to bring anything in, please, I'd like this to be an interactive workshop. Um, the most important thing is that we respect one another's opinions um, and also share the space and that we can provide each other with a supportive environment here. Um, and there is further support available outside of this webinar. So please access the calendly.com calendar and you will be able to book in whatever you need for yourself or your child. Um, and again, it's important that we look after ourselves in this. So if any of this uh, website webinar is triggering at all or you find it um, too much then please self-monitor and look after your own emotional regulation so if you need to leave the webinar at any point please please um, feel free to and again if there's a screen etiquette on zoom requires us to say that if we um, do need to leave the room or you need to have a conversation please mute your mic I will mute them all at the beginning but then I will unmute when we have our, our discussions okay any questions so far Great, let's carry on. So this is a great quote I like to start off with. It's Hans Henry Klug, who is the regional director for the World Health Organization. And he talks about the issue of COVID-19. So it's facing each and every one of us now. And it's how we manage and react to the stressful situation unfolding so rapidly in our lives uh, and communities. So we can draw on the remarkable powers of strength and cooperation that we also fortunately possess as humans. And that, and that is why we must try and focus on the response most effectively to this crisis as individuals, family and community members, friends and colleagues. And I think that summarises it for us, really, that we know we're going through this really difficult period, but we know that we can also draw on the powers of strength and cooperation. So it's important that we normalise how you may be feeling, first of all, as parents. So you may be feeling tense, you may be finding it hard to focus yourselves or having very soon thoughts. Um, and this can be a stress response. And we're going to be talking about stress responses here on this webinar today. So what is anxiety? So it's normal. Let's first of all normalise it. It's a normal reaction. It's a normal emotion we have to any experience. And you may think of it as a feeling such as being stressed, tense, maybe worried and uneasy or scared. And it is a normal reaction to everyday life. And it does help us get things done when we need to. And sometimes when stress and anxiety is prolonged and sustained, it can be damaging and it can affect mental health. And we'll talk about that. Um, so when you're in that stress response, it does trigger the fight, flight or freeze response. And you may notice different feelings in your body, um, such as a dry mouth. Your eyes may be wider. Your skin may be full, a little bit sweaty. Lungs are breathing deeper. Your heart's beating faster. And your stop sometimes, stomach can sometimes have that sick feeling where you're... Um, your food's not being digested and the muscles can appear tense so you may be able to notice signs of anxiety in yourselves 
So we have the para parasympathetic nervous system that allows us to rest and digest and the sympathetic nervous system um, is what puts us into, into fight or flight or freeze response. Now these are part of the autonomic nervous system. So it's important that we have triggering parasympathetic system here. So we're going to be looking at how we can do that. So do you recognize anxiety in yourselves? Let's have a look at this. So sometimes we may notice that sort of avoidance or we may feel a bit more forgetful, uh, have trouble sleeping. So pick out any of those that resonate with you and just reflect on that for a minute because anxiety does present differently in each of us and you will see it present differently in your children as well. So it's important that we notice that. So it's really important that we acknowledge the physical effects of those um, that have been infected or that maybe have even been um, the bereavement through loss. And there can be mental trauma with that. So that it's a fear that we're all facing at the moment. So when this trauma does reach um, a level where it negatively impacts us as a whole societies or groups of people, we call that collective trauma. And it's important to acknowledge that. And collective trauma can follow um, instances such as war, mass genocide or um, violence and pandemics. So sometimes the fear comes about from the actual not knowing how this is going to play out. We don't have a time limit. We don't know how it's going to um, end. So it, it can cause us stress and anxiety in terms of the economic effects, the physical effects and how it's going to affect your mental well-being and that of your family. So if we look at trauma in this triangle, in the centre here you have yourself, the green triangle, and that impact will be dependent on whether you've really come under any past traumas, any past bereavements or loss, or if you yourself have any social, emotional, mental health um, challenges. That will impact on how you experience this pandemic. Then we have the health um, triangle here, the blue one. So again, people around you, they may have uh, had illness, you may have experienced loss yourself. And that is part of the trauma triangle. And then there could be the financial implications around job loss or furlough um, and how the future economic sort of pans out. And then at the top of the triangle, we've got the green, uh, sorry, the red triangle, um, which is impacting us as a community. Well, we've had closures of schools, for example, obviously you're all doing homeward at home at the moment. Um, sports centres are closed. So our ability to come together as a community has really stopped at the moment. So it is considered a crisis, a pandemic, because it is traumatising and re-traumatising for anybody that has experienced trauma in their lives in the past. So it's important we acknowledge that. And really, Aidan here talks about it violates the familiar ideas and expectations about the world of an individual or society, and it plunges them into a state of extreme confusion and uncertainty. And then traumatic events can really impair our ability to grasp and cope with what's going on right now. So it's important we acknowledge that. So now we've acknowledged how trauma can affect a society, it's important we look at how we can support our children. And resilient children really are part of what we call the biopsychosocial model of health. There's no one key here to producing a child that has ultimate resiliency. There is a number of factors and it's important we acknowledge those factors. And we look at what we call in mental health first aid terms, the risk factors and the protective factors. And it's the balance between those. So the risk factors at the moment are that we're obviously we're all in social isolation. Protective factors could be that they're feeling safe at home with you and enjoying a routine and healthy attachments. So it's about looking at the factors that can have a positive or negative influence on your child's mental health. So what does help children bounce back from trauma? The resiliency factors look at individual really level traits, family characteristics and community. So all of that will play a big part in how we bounce back from this trauma and that's for your children as well. So already we're looking at resilience for ourselves and our community at school and really part of that is effective relationships. It's relationships that's going to be key throughout this whole period um, and connection, maintaining connection. That's why it's fantastic that we're using all our teams, our Zooms, so that your teachers get a sense of connection with, with your children. And we're going to be helping managing those emotions by holding these webinars, by carrying on with our wellbeing club. You've probably seen the children accessing the Buzz Club uh, activities. And all of those are centered around supporting your children to manage their emotions and build on their existing strengths. 
So again, that's important that we take that into account. So how are we going to manage our own anxiety in isolation during quarantine? Because to manage our own anxiety will really enable us to support our children as well. Because children do learn from the adults around them. It's really important that we acknowledge that. So managing our own stress is good to talk to friends and family. Um, you can take part in some activities, maybe mindfulness, breathing or relaxation and trying to minimize your stresses. Now, when I run mental health first aid courses, I'm always talking about how you look after your media diet. That is, are you constantly scrolling through a social feed? Are you looking at the news online? Be mindful of how you do that. And also be mindful of how you are around your children with news feed. Um, take care of your simple things like sleep, diet, exercise. Now, that's one of the main factors in poor mental health. When we start to lose sleep, it can impact. So be mindful of your own sleep and routine. So here we have what we call our thoughts and feelings and actions wheel. This is a, a what we call a cognitive behavioral therapy um, theory. So it looks at how our thoughts do impact our feelings and our actions. So we'll be looking at this a little bit later about how you can notice this in your children. So just take a moment here to notice where your thoughts are right at this moment. What are you thinking? Now take a moment to connect with how you're feeling inside of your body. So let's do a scan as we sort of all sit here. So start at your feet and just notice how they're grounded on the floor. Do you notice shoe or sock you're wearing how does it feel as you come up your legs just notice how your muscles are feeling how are you positioned where are you noticing any sensations and as we come up towards our core area our stomach our chest notice where your muscles are tense where you're sitting how you're positioned and bring it up so through to your shoulders and to your arms and then up into your head space. Where are you noticing the feelings at the moment? And it's really good just to do a check in with yourself and really see how you're feeling there. And we can see here seven core human emotions and we've got the love, fear, anger, sadness, happiness, surprise and disgust. And from those, we have many different associated feelings. So it's really good to connect with that and really take notice of how you're feeling as a parent. Also, just reflect on how you look after your own mental health. Are you, um, do you use reflection? Do you connect with people? Do you talk? Sometimes in this period, I always recommend a period of journaling just so you can keep an eye on your own emotions and write down how you're feeling and just have that space to reflect for yourselves because you are supporting your children through this period and that will have an impact. Some of you will be working at home, some of you will be uh, running the homeschooling, some of you will be caring for uh, sick relatives. So be mindful of how you react and how you look after your own mental health. So this is something I use as a visual with children when they enter one-to-one -one therapy with me. I like the analogy of the, um, the iceberg. So the tip of the iceberg there we can see above the waterline. We know that that's 10%. But 90% of that iceberg sits beneath the waterline. So have a look. Sometimes when we notice anger in our children or in ourselves, um, there's irritation there. That's an, an emotion that can be expressed. We can really project onto that. Oh, I'm just annoyed. I want to get a haircut or people are getting on my nerves or you didn't make the bed. Those little things that can trigger that angry feeling. But it's really important that we're mindful of what's not being expressed underneath the waterline, that sense of um, sadness, um, maybe there's loss of disconnection there, and a fear around maybe health or finances. So I always recommend to notice the feelings. And when we, dec when we deal with difficult feelings, it's important that it will move, it will change, nothing stays the same. So it's important that we stay with the feeling and the feeling, notice it where it sits in your body. And if you can, or if you can help your children to, to name the feeling. And then once we've sat with that feeling, you, it's really good to be able to let it go and reconnect with how you feel that sense of safety. So this is a really good visual. There's no source for this, unfortunately. I found this on Twitter. So it's really good for um, us to connect with where we are at the moment, where we want to be within these zones. Now, it's important to normalise as well that we will move between these zones. So one day we may find ourselves in the fear zone, the next the learning zone and the growth zone. And it will be different feelings for different days. 
So just take a moment to look at this graphic and see where you sit yourself. Uh, it could be that we're finding ourselves complaining. We could be forwarding messages that are traumatizing or triggering. Um, we could be looking through to moving into the learning zone where we're starting to identify our emotions and we take notice of how we're feeling. Um, we like to verify information before we share it. So we're finding a source. Um, we do acknowledge that everyone's trying their best in this period. And then we might find ourselves moving into the growth zone where we do find a purpose in this period. We're thinking about how we can help others and we're using our skills and services really to help others in need. So where are you sitting at the moment in this zone? Just think about that for a moment. So as we move into supporting your family now, let's think about children will observe adults' behaviour and emotions and they'll look at how to manage their own emotions um, during these difficult times from the adults around them. So it's really important, again, that I spent that first part of the webinar looking at how you regulate your own emotions. So let's go back to this thoughts and feelings and actions wheel. As parents, we will be noticing different behaviours in our children. Now, how many times do we react to a behaviour or an action of our child? It may be that we say to them, don't do that or let's, let's find a different strategy there. So notice the action and we could reflect on that. We could say, I notice you are feeling, you know, I notice you did that. I noticed that happened. I wonder how you're feeling right now. I'm wondering if you're feeling a bit sad inside and that might be difficult for you to put into words. Now, sometimes children find it really hard to verbalize a feeling. So I always use an interception method where we connect with the feeling inside of the body. So ask them where they're feeling a body. Where do they feel it inside of them? And if they can connect with it, ask them to describe it to you. So it may be that they're feeling a sense of um, tightness or a feeling of um, prickliness in their throat. Get them to describe the feeling. Is it blue? Is it shaped? Is it round? Is it square? Is it fluffy? And if they can, they can even draw that feeling. Because sometimes just being able to describe it in that sense rather than use a word is enough to express the feeling. And we call that interoception. So again, connect with what you see, reflect the action, and then also connect with the feeling that they might not be able to express. So if anyone has um, come to therapy with myself, I do use these blob tree tools. They're really, really useful for children, even for adults actually, to express how they're feeling at the moment. So I'm gonna invite you now to have a look at this tree here and see if you connect with any of the blobs on this tree. Which one resonates with you? So when you've chosen a blob, what we're going to do at the end is we're going to reflect on how your blob is feeling. And the talk with your child is all about the blob. It's not about them. So your child may say to you, actually, at the moment, I'm feeling maybe H here, sat in the tree. So that's holding on to the tree. It's holding on tight. And we can see maybe G here is reaching up sort of to help them out. So ask your child about the blob. Okay. I wonder how H is feeling right now. I wonder what H needs. I wonder if H can see anybody else on the tree that can help Blob. So you're getting the children to describe the feeling, you're getting them to connect with it, and you're getting them to make their own solutions. And that's really important in emotional regulation because we're not here to regulate our children. They need to do that for themselves. All your being is almost the director. So you're allowing them to have that reach that resolution. And again, on the right hand side here, you can see what we call our mood scale. Now, this goes from one calm and happy at the bottom of the scale. And as we move up the scale, the emoticons start to feel maybe a bit tired, a bit hungry, not sure, a bit confused, a bit embarrassed. And then maybe as it goes up, it starts to get sad, worried and then really sad. And then you start to move into the area where there's no going down again. The only way is to go up to discharge. So if we can help children when they're in this zone here, number six, it will help them from going up here to complete meltdown. So it's really important that you help your children by reflecting on where they are on this mood scale. And I'm gonna send these resources out afterwards. So if you have got a printer at home, you can print this out and stick it up on the fridge. And just a daily check-in. How are you doing today? I wonder what number you are on the mood ladder. If they're noticing themselves here, here or here, then maybe it's time to use what we call our self-soothing strategies. 
And this week's wellbeing exercise does look at building themselves a cool down box. So we're calling that our calm box where they can access things that make them feel calm and regulated and bring them back down the mood scale. So have a look at that this week on the Buzz Club channel on the Teams. So again, regulate yourselves as well. So really look at how you're feeling. Now there's lots of different blobs on here. You can see, and there's no right or wrong answer to these blobs. So please don't feel that if they pick this one that's falling, oh my gosh, you've got to be really worried. No, just say, okay, how's O feeling? I wonder how O got there. What does O need? So this blob here can have supports around it. And a sense of that falling blob just means that they're feeling a bit lost. Um, so it's important to connect with the feeling, not the action. Again, I've added a, I've adapted this blob tree because I've added one over here that's in isolation. So a few of these blobs have got face masks on as well. So it's important we normalise that for our children. And I'm actually preparing some therapy toys for when we go back to school as well. So it's important that children have the ability to play out um, this pandemic. And I'll, I'll show this up to camera. I've used this idea that I've seen and I'm creating these little figures to use in sand tray work. So this enables the children to play out how they feel and how they see the pandemic for themselves. So it could be that you might use a sense of play with your children to help them play out their own feelings. And play and metaphors are really powerful for children. That is their form of communication. Children like to communicate through play. So if you can connect with the characters of a film that they're watching or a book they're reading, really use that metaphor to get in touch with them. So I'm a great believer in the child-centered approach. In my therapeutic work, I am child-led. So I have the complete belief that given the right environment, children can bring themselves to self-heal. Um, we don't need to do the work. You just need to be available and be the right environment for them. So a sense of congruency is really important. Um, giving your child that sense of unconditional positive regard as well. Like having the ability to trust that they can solve their own uh, feelings, so that they can solve their own emotional regulation. And just being that empathetic understanding and being listened to and understood is really empowering. And Carl Rogers called these his core conditions and this really forms the basis of all my therapeutic interventions. And I really recommend this for yourself, that sense of being um, held in congruence, uh, regard and empathy, really powerful. So we talked earlier about interoception and how this works. So again, this, this graphic looks at how you feel inside it's the ability to manage your own reactions to your feelings so where they may be able to, unable to uh, describe a feeling why not invite them to have a look at how it feels inside so that feeling sounds really hard to describe i wonder where you may feel that inside connect to it so this is a really good graphic it looks at the three r's so remember as parents we're going to regulate relate and reason so it's really hard for a child to regulate themselves around dysregulated adults. So it's important that we are regulated in our own um, emotional uh, state. So again, if we don't regulate our children, it's important that they notice that they feel that sense of fear, sadness, frustration. So when we regulate, we're gonna focus on soothing them, make them feel calm, self, safe and loved. And then we're going to relate that feeling with the tone of our voice. So I can see, I know you're upset right now and I know it's hard. So again, you're validating that feeling for them. And then once they've calmed and they're regulated, then we can go back and do that sense of reflection. So we can talk about alternative behaviours if they have had a meltdown or if you've seen some actions that you feel is a bit unhealthy. So, okay, that happened this time. I noticed you did this, but what would you do next time when you're feeling like that? Just allow them that space to come up with their own solution. So I really like these self-holding techniques. Um, this is something that's used in a lot of trauma-informed therapy. So I'm going to share these with you today. And this is something you can do with your children. You can show them the technique. And it's really good for a regulation. This can be used with, um, with people that have um, are living with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So let's try it now. So I invite you to take your hand, either one, and place one on your forehead here and one here on your chest, just next to your heart. And just apply as much pressure as you like there and just hold it for a moment and just connect with how that feels for you.
Okay, well done. So now let's try the next one. We're going to take our right hand, we're going to place it over our heart, and then we're going to place our left hand over our middle. So as you hold it there, apply as much pressure as you need. How does that feel? Again, invite your children to try that. And there are a few there. There's one you can see on the image there on the right. So they'll hold at the front and you hold at the back of the head. Try that. There's also one where you can hold at the front and maybe hold just at the base of the neck here. And this is where your vagal nerve is. And polyvagal theory looks at how our nerve ending here connects with our heart and our stomach. And to soothe the vagal nerve, it allows us to really regulate. So try that. How does that feel? Well done. So again, it's really important to enable your child to express how they're feeling, and that can be in different ways. So I'm going to put the resource of this blob tree here as well. They may connect with a certain blob on this tree and let them describe the blob. So I invite you to pick a blob for yourself right now. Which blob are you feeling? Now it could be, for example, this one we see down here with the blindfold. Um, this one may be feeling a sense of disconnection from people on the tree. It can't see them. It's safe because it's grounded, but it's not feeling connected to the tree. So if we look around, they may pick this blob here. This blob here just feels like it's sort of melting into the ground. This blob here is helping another blob. So again, no right or wrong answer with this tree. Any blob on here is okay. It's just about reflecting on how the blob's doing. And remember, don't question the, your child as such, question the blob. I wonder what blob needs right now. And that helps them describe the feeling. So again, it's really important. Now we all know that if we're on a plane, that the first thing we're told to do is put the oxygen mask on ourselves. That gives us the ability to then help others. So it's important that you look after yourselves in this period. What are you doing for your own self-care? So again, a great graphic here for Mental Health First Aid England. They look at where your mental health is. Do yourself a check-in. How are you feeling? How are you looking after your well-being? How are my thoughts right now? And what is in my stress container? So we're going to look at the stress container next. So the stress container depends on the vulnerability that you have. So this container you see here will be different sizes for different people. So if your vulnerability is low, then you're going to find your container will not be able to hold much. We all have stresses that flow into our containers and then we all have a tap at the bottom. Now, if we use helpful coping strategies, this tap opens and the stresses flow out. And that's really good. But sometimes we have unhelpful coping strategies. So we'll need to look at that as well. But if this tap for any reason gets stuck, then what we're going to find is this fills up and then we have an overflow here. Now, during this overflow, we may find we're having some emotional snapping. And that's really important to notice. And then we need to reconnect with this tap and find out what we need to do to allow some of these stresses to flow out. Now, I'm a great believer in healthy boundaries. Now, this graphic is something I put out earlier at the start of lockdown. So boundaries are something that sometimes we don't always talk about. We have boundaries in every area of our life. You might have a fence around your house. You can have a boundary around going to work and returning from work, going to school. We have time boundaries, people boundaries and places boundaries. So now this period of lockdown means that our boundaries have all changed. They're all different. Now that different boundary needs a renegotiation. So it's important that you have that conversation explicitly within your families and you renegotiate those boundaries of how you want life to be. So whether that means that you have a timetable on the fridge that you talk about when dinner is, how homeschoolings run, how you fit your work in around your children's schooling. So all of that requires some negotiation. So again, I'll put this on the resources at the end so you can reflect on this with your families. Now there's a really good um, survival guide here. I'm going to put the link to this in the resources also. Um, it was written by a gentleman called Julian Stodd and it looks at how we can survive working from home for those parents that are finding themselves working at home and also parenting and running the house. 
So I'm going to sort of come towards the end now. We're going to talk about how sleep is really important. Sleep is an essential part to maintain health and mental well health. So you may notice as well that you or your children are noticing real vivid dreams right now. And that's really normal as well at the moment. Um, if you're interested, you can write down the reflections in your dreams and really connect with the core feeling that you have in a dream. That's just our conscious, our unconscious trying to make sense of how we're feeling right now. So there's some really good rules for sleep. And if you want some more support on sleep, because sleep does get interrupted when we're feeling anxious and we are in that fight, flight or freeze response. Um, have a look at the Sleep Council website. They've got some really good strategies. It enables you to do it almost a bed audit, a sleep audit, and look at what's going on in your bedrooms for you to be able to set the scene for good, healthy sleep. So there's some simple strategies here. So it's really good to sort of have a nice dark room, don't eat too much before bed, um, and restrict your alcohol content, and look at what devices you've got in your room and try and think about the temperature in your room. And if you find that you're not sleeping, don't focus on the fact that you're not sleeping because the thought of not sleeping then impacts the anxiety, which then goes in this huge cycle where it just goes round and round and round. So if you're finding yourself not able to sleep, then don't focus and punish yourself on that. Find something you can do that will regulate you. So I'd like to leave us today with a message of hope. Now it's always hopeful. Mental health, poor mental health is recoverable. If anybody has been on one of my mental health first aid courses, we always talk about the mental health continuum. Now the continuum goes from mental well health to mental poor health, and it also looks at well-being. So whether or not someone's got a diagnosed mental health issue or they're having poor mental health at the moment, what's important message I'd like to leave you all with is that we can recover. We will recover from this. We are resilient human beings. So this is a message of hope. And this is based on what we call the recovery model, which is again holistic and it's person centered. And it's based on the two simple premise really that it is possible to recover and that it's recoverable through directed, healthy, reparative relationships. So as we come towards the end, this is a space for questions now. And I really want to thank you for listening and taking time to really check in this webinar. Um, and please, I am available. I am booking services. So if you want to access any wellbeing support, please use the link you see here in front of you. Uh, we will continue with these weekly webinars. So if you want to uh, request a subject, if you think something might be useful for you, please let me know. So as we've reached the end today, I just want to say thank you so much. I will put the resources online for you to share, to use, to connect. Um, and again, please contact me if you do need any support. And I thank you for listening today and take care of yourselves.